But anyways, let's start. We have uh, Yuri Tomikawa. She is the founder and CEO of Zenker. In her case, it's a, it's a company that has been around for quite a few years. And, and she has been doing this for, for some time out of her personal passion for finding the right therapist. Then we have Cheaper Stops. She, he is an investor in Rock Health. Rock Health is a health tech uh, focused uh, VC. And then we have Garang, who very admirably just started a um, uh, queer focused, mental health focused uh, startup. I've seen what he's, do what he's done and it's pretty amazing. But I'm going to stop talking now and let them uh, tell you by themselves what are the, the things they do. And we can start with jewelry, then garland, then cheaper. Thanks, Eduardo. Um, should I give like an overview of like why I started Zenker and what we do? Yes, just a, a quick uh, overview of uh, why, why you started, uh, why you do it, and anything else you, you would like to say about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Um, my name is Yuri. I'm the founder of Zencare.co. It's a website uh, that helps people find the right therapist for them. Um, I started it over five years ago now. Um, out of my own experience of looking for a therapist, I found the process to be extremely overwhelming and frustrating. Um, you know, it was really my first time looking for a therapist. Um, and I didn't know, you know, who was going to be a good fit. Um, a lot of the profiles online were totally outdated, you know, and after reaching out to providers, I would be told they're not taking new clients or their fees were, you know, way out of my budget. Um, and I wanted that process to be much smoother and streamlined for other folks. So that's why I started Zencare. Um, you know, we are a marketplace to find the right therapist for you. And we're really aiming to empower the therapy seeker to uh, you know, feel empowered in that process. So we quality vet all our providers, we really get to know them, ensure that whoever you reach out to through Zencare, you're gonna be connected with a really good provider. Um, we take photos and a video of the provider so you can get a sense of what a therapist is like. It can be really anxiety provoking uh, to reach out to someone you know, when you don't really know much about them or what they're going to be like. Um, and we heard from people who would go into an appointment in five minutes and they knew it wasn't a good fit. So we're trying to eliminate that. Um, and then you can actually book a free initial call with a provider directly through our platform as well. Um, and we're here to support if there's any issues in getting connected to, with the provider. Um, we're a team of seven now. Um, and we are in 10 different markets um, throughout the US, um, New York, Boston, um, Rhode Island are some of our biggest markets as well as Los Angeles. Um, and uh, yeah, we're really excited to continue to grow um, and to you know, make that process of finding a therapist even easier. So I think that's all. That's all. Good. Awesome. <clears throat> Great intro, Yuri. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Grong. I'm the founder of Violet. It's joinviolet.com. Um, we actually started building Violet at the start of this year in January. Great year to be starting a business. Um, we are doing, we're a very similar business as Yuri's and Zencare. We're, we're trying to connect um, the community to really strong quality therapists, um, except our focus is predominantly only on the queer community. Um, the reason I started Violet is um, one, I was tired of seeing LGBTQ and one dropped on value. I feel like we're a really diverse community and so much of mental health care is really connecting with the provider. So we, we're building really backend frameworks to do really effective matching so that um, people can find queer competent providers that are really focused on the subset of the community they belong to. Um, and the example I always use is if you're a mother in Kansas looking for a queer competent therapist for your child, that's going to be a very different therapist than if you're a TGNC individual looking to speak about gender identity. And we actually get into the nitty gritty of what the therapists are really skilled at speaking to and what they want to speak to. Awesome. And then I can round things out. And um, thank you so much, Eduardo, for having us. Um, so I'm Chipper. I work as an investor at Rock Health. Um, we do early stage uh, investing in digital healthcare companies. So predominantly software enabled companies um, at the seed and series A. Um, I've had the pleasure of working on a number of behavioral health deals that we've done over the past couple of years, um, including platforms like Equip Health, which is a telemedicine platform for 
right now just adolescents with eating disorders, but plans to move upwards to adults, um, as well as our investment that we announced yesterday in a company called Brightline that does pediatric behavioral and developmental health. Um, and I actually got my career started at a, a digital mental health company called Joyable, which provided telemedicine based care to folks with social anxiety. Um, so spent a lot of time in this space. Um, it's been really interesting to be on the investor side of it, although I do have to admit, um, I'm about to make a transition to go work on the operating side. So I'll probably take some tips from Garang and Yuri both um, to work at our newest investment right line in a couple of weeks. So happy to share more. Great. Thank you, guys and uh, and girl for for sharing your your background and what are you doing with the company. So everyone, as you see, we have a very good mix of company stages and 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 levels at which uh, the panelists are are working now. So and we also have very great great questions from everyone who signed up to the webinar. We just ha had one asking uh, right now something that. It is actually a point of discussion. Uh, we will try to answer as many of the questions as we can from what we receive and, and mix it in the conversation. If you don't feel that you got an answer, you can always reach, uh, reach out and, and continue to look for, for resources. So let's see. The first one, which I think, uh, and I definitely include myself there, uh, ironically working from home was the most disruptive work-life balance thing, uh, unbalanced thing uh, that could ever happen to me. So uh, a consistent question uh, was, how do you manage uh, your work-life balance? Maybe we can say it in general, maybe uh, including COVID. So what about you going first cheaper? Sure, yeah, I think certainly echo um, whoever wrote that question. I think a lot of us are still figuring it out um, months into the kind of COVID experience. Um, I do though think that at least I've had the fortune of working at a company where this time allowed us to have more honest conversations about our behavioral health at large. I think it's certainly an area of healthcare that continues to have stigma surrounding it. And yet it's also become part of the industry that people are getting more comfortable talking about in the wake of COVID. Um, and so I've found that from sort of the top down, our leadership has been vocal about challenges that they've had, you know, facing how to figure out balance of raising their own children at home and not having any time away from them, you know, right now being a teacher and working full time, um, trying to put food on the table and, you know, I don't have any of those challenges and yet still continue to, to figure out the best way to manage. Um, I think it, it begins really with like an open, open dialogue, which certainly can be hard to do, um, depend on your company culture. But I found in, in our experience, even pre COVID when folks were, you know, working the classic eight hours a day, taking the transit home for an hour and then hopping back online, like being able to have that conversation of like feeling bandwidth constrained and an inability to complete work at the same kind of pace and level that they'd like to um, creates challenges for the business at large. And so it's about both, I think, connecting your personal um, feeling towards the challenge that you're experiencing, as well as like the larger business challenges that the company is going to face as a result of, of, you know, your mental health challenges. I think largely like employers are starting to pay attention to that now. Um, obviously, unfortunately, with the reality we're living in, but it, it has been a, a little glimmer of hope in what seems to be like a, a challenging world right now. I think Eduardo, are you maybe muted? Yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I have my phone, uh, my phone for the audio. Um, in your case, Garen, that you decided to start the, the company uh, very close or in the middle of this happening, uh, have you found any challenge with the work-life balance or, or what is your, your experience uh, starting from scratch? Yeah, um, the, so we started Violet in January and we were, I was already personally going through the transition of being in an office setting to kind of being on my own, starting to validate a specific idea and incubate the idea. Um, so there was already a life transition at that point. And then when COVID hit with quarantines taking place, there is a lot of challenges. Um, I live with roommates, so that has a different set of challenges as well. And 
um, ultimately we're, I'm catalyzing mental health conversations. So I have on our therapist side, we constantly aggregate feedback where the therapists tell us that, hey, X patient, unfortunately is, they can't attend the session because it's really hard to have an open dialogue in a setting where there may be roommates involved or a significant other involved where I can't really truly speak my feelings. Um, so speaking personally, just through my experience, um, with regards to work-life balance, I've noticed that I've tried to be kinder to myself and it's okay if there's days where I like miss a morning workout or if it's a later start to the day. The key is to just try and keep like a bigger focus. So for me, I have weekly goals that as long as they're met, I'm personally pretty okay with what time frames I ended up working throughout the day. And um, I think just being more open and honest with yourself has been pretty helpful. It, it reminds me of, uh, of this funny thing I read on Instagram. Someone posted, stop trying to behave as if we are not going through a pandemic. And I, I, I thought, yeah, that's very true. I, I, I give myself a very hard time for not waking up very early for not doing this, that, that, that. And then you have to think, wait, we, we are not living in the normal, in the normal world. I should stop pushing me to, to do the normal things. And talking about normal, the many, many people are juggling with, okay, I need to keep my mental health awareness and at the same time, uh, getting used to a pandemic and invent a new way of living. For many people, that means I lost my job. For many people, it means I have to work from home and I used to go every day to the office. Well, uh, anybody who wants to give an opinion on how, how do you juggle with those things, like keeping mental health self-awareness in the middle of adjusting your life to, to the pandemic? Yeah, I can jump in on that. Um, and also kind of just answer the previous question too together. Um, I think there are things yeah, I think everyone's been adjusting as is clear from this discussion already. And, um, you know, for me, the adjustment is both on a personal level and also on a team level. And I think uh, it's also like constant, you know, effort for both. So it's not like, you know, uh, I think at the beginning of the pandemic was different than the middle and, you know, now and kind of going forward. So I think there's constant um, improvement as well on a personal level in terms of, you know, wellness. Um, I've actually started new habits. So I do uh, morning gratitude meditations, um, which I started in May and I've been doing them daily. And some days I won't do, but you know, for the most part, it's been really helpful. Um, and I was trying to do daily yoga. Um, now it's just like 10 minutes of, of asanas, but that's still really helpful for me. Um, and then, you know, um, some other small things personally are things like, you know, taking my dog to the park. Um, I just like need to get out of the apartment and, you know, actually get into nature and summer is a great time to do that. So that's really fortunate. Um, and then making sure to take vacation if you can. Um, I know that feels like a luxury, um, both in terms of finances and also in terms of just the ability, like mobility right now. Um, but, you know, if you are able to go somewhere close by, um, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, somewhere in Long Island, if you're in New York, or, you know, somewhere upstate for a hike or anything like that, that's been really helpful too. And then on a team level, you know, I think if there are founder, other founders on this call, I think it's something that, you know, again, I need to work more on as a team. Um, but things like, you know, keeping connected as a team, I think is really important. So things like, you know, as a founder, you want to set an example too. Um, and again, I could be doing better here, but things like setting your Slack channel, you know, uh, status to um, taking a walk or you know, therapy um, and just proactively showing that you're taking those steps. Uh, that's something I've been doing and, you know, we've really encouraged as a team just to feel connected about, you know, what each person is doing like lunch or, you know, things like that. Um, we do team lunches Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So that's been really nice. And then team drinks on Thursdays. Um, my team is actually um, doing a breath work session uh, right now. So, um, you know, having events, even if it's remote, um, has also been really helpful. And then um, we do a lot of one-on-ones. So really checking in, you know, during our one-on-ones, not only how are you doing professionally, but also personally um, has also been really helpful. Someone else would like to give an opinion on this one? 
you know, quickly, I think those are all really um, great tactics here that you shared. Um, it it kind of reminded me that reminded me of a conversation we had a couple of weeks ago where folks are like, I I really do enjoy these sort of like lunches or informal things, but like the amount of meetings you're throwing on my calendar is ridiculous. Like, yes, it's good to have that optionality of connection, but I think it's about again that optionality portion. At least for us as a team, we're pretty small. We're only ten or so, and so when you have a one-on-one -on -one with someone or you have, you know, a, a meeting with two or three people, you're already sort of having that touch point throughout the week with them and adding on like an extra layer of like lunches three times a week or every day. It's a good reminder for certain people like myself who are like very extroverted, need a lot of like human social hours, but there's certainly folks on our team who are like, I love heads down work time. And like, I used to have a lot of it. Now you guys are throwing so many meetings on. Um, and so I think it's about like, again, having that dialogue with your team to figure out like providing the optionality to attend these types of things, especially if you are a founder and a leader um, and being able to allow folks to like come where they feel like they could use that sort of energy boost in the day and give folks the time who, you know, do enjoy that heads down work time. So they end up doing their work at night, the like chance to, to have that type of break as well. Great. So I, this one is for you, Garan because uh, I, I'm going to put uh, two questions together, is uh, do you think uh, in the, teleter the teletherapy tech industry is going to continue growing, considering you are in the first stages of, uh, well, the, in the very first stage of creating a company? Uh, do you think it will continue growing? And then how do you stand out in a crowded field? I mean, what, what is not crowded now? Everything has been done almost so it's, it's uh, reinventing uh, reinventing something but uh, someone mentioned it, you can have the best product and still need to pro prove that you should get attention so how, how do you work with those two yeah Eduardo much. is putting on his investor hat <laughs> <laughs> um, with regards to the first one um, absolutely I think telehealth overall will keep becoming more ubiquitous with how we live and um, I see healthcare totally being fluid. Um, actually, there's a company called Tia that I really admire where they had a digital product that turned into a physical connect. And I think those types of situations, as long as the product really supports a fluid um, relationship can actually be the biggest win for patients overall. Because there's times where like life happens and I can't make my therapy session. I want like a virtual therapy session. But there's other times where I actually really, really do need to disconnect personally and going in person is the best route for me. So having that optionality means a lot to me personally. And I, um, I've kind of heard that a lot of our patients and clients definitely feel the same. And then regarding your second question with how to stand out in a saturated market, um, this sounds really cliche, but letting your customers tell you what's doing, what's going well and what's not. Um, being pretty much a pilot for this year and learning a lot about what does queer competent care mean and what makes, um, if we were to parse out LGBTQ instead of one drop down value into an actual product, what would that look like? Um, for us, that really is what's helping us stand out. Um, so we identified key product features, things like hey, our TGNC folks, um, they want to find, if one of them is transitioning, they want to find a specific provider that'll write a support letter. Well, that's not something that tech companies are currently supporting. And to me, that's a key queer competency where that client wants to be able to filter seamlessly and find a provider that can support that. Um, similarly, there's like, we're building a collection of these experiences where um, having seamless product offerings and giving users exactly what they want really does help us stand out. And um, we've been really building from the bottom up, meaning we think of Violet as this is exactly the health product that queer people want. Also, most of my team is queer, which helps, but to us by building for the community, it's really what's gonna help us stick out in a very saturated field. How how do you keep them motivated being a, an emerging startup? How do you keep your team like, oh yeah, let's do this even though the whole yeah. world is upside down? Um, I feel really fortunate. My team is three people, but I know all of them from Oscar. So it's been really easy kind of working with friends. In one essence, it kind of feels like we're all getting our PhDs working on things. And one of my teammates is actually getting a PhD. So it's been helpful to kind of 
um, there's moments of excitement where they come into the room saying, hey, look, I learned this in my class, let's talk about it. And then there's moments where I say, oh, in a provider interview, we learned this, let's talk about this. So it's a lot of just knowledge sharing and being oddly just excited about what we're building. Great. And now um, you mentioned it, uh, Yuri, that you, you've been doing this for five years and I'm sure that uh, three years ago, things were very different than, than they are right now. So a very good question here is how to stay motivated when payoff seems so far away? And, and maybe you are still not in the, oh, this is payoff, I made it. But maybe you are in the place where you say, we're good. So how do you keep yourself uh, up and motivated uh, throughout the process? Yeah, I will say that the first like three and a half years, I felt like, you know, this constant, not doubt, but question of like, are we going to make it? And there's no real definition of that, right? That's really up to what you define, or I guess maybe what your investors dis define as, you know, success. But for me, I don't have investors. So, um, you know, I could have decided on that kind of measure of success, but it was really, am I going to be able to build a sustainable business? And I felt only like a year and a half ago did I reach that point. So it was a really long time of, you know, just, um, there's a chart. Uh, I think maybe if you search like startup, uh, founder chart that you basically start really high and it's like, Oh my God, this is a great idea. I'm going to do so well. It's like, huh, it's kind of hard. And then you go into the trough of sorrow at the very bottom and you don't know how long that <laughs> trough of sorrow is. And it's where you're like, Oh my gosh, this is so hard. There are so many things I didn't know. Um, you know, how am I going to make this work? And then you kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're kind of like, you know, up here. And at some point, the, you know, the idea is that you IPO, right? Um, but I think that when you are in that trough of sorrow or anywhere kind of before that, you know, and light at the end of the tunnel, um, a few things, you know, one at a kind of big picture level, just remembering why you started this. Um, that's what I did. You know, I really wrote down kind of why I'm doing this, um, why I believe in this, why I think this product needs to exist. Um, and I think I like taped it up on the wall just so that if I felt down, you know, I would look at that. Um, and then second is much more on a granular level, on a daily level. I think, you know, kind of going back to the work-life balance, it is really important to stay healthy emotionally and physically, even during these times when all you're thinking and doing, you know, is your startup. Um, but I think, you know, it's a marathon at the end of the day. And so um, being able to make time for sleep, I mean, sleep was huge for me, um, a good diet and exercise. Um, you know, I think at YC, those are the three things they recommend <laughs> doing, like work, sleep and eat, um, and maybe exercise. So uh, I think, yeah, just keeping an eye on the ultimate goal while also making sure you're taking care of yourself in the short run. That's, that's very good. And going to, to this point of uh, being inspired cheaper, you, you are in the VCs, on the VC side, which by the way, I would like to highlight that Yuri just said that he, she doesn't have investors. And there's no right or wrong way to do it, but it, for, for all of the ambitious, aspiring entrepreneurs, this is a proof that you can go as far as, as Zenker is right now. We just, whatever I have, let's just do it. Another cliche, Dito, Dito Garang, is uh, there's never the right time to start anything. So you just go for it and figure it, uh, figure it out as you go. And now, uh, how would you uh, cheaper your work with different companies? And I'm sure you get to have meetings with different founders. You need to follow up on what's the progress. So do you have any, any tips, recommendations that you've seen them doing? Um, they found someone that is struggling uh, with mental health or, that, or someone, or maybe even in your own experience, uh, there's someone that you know needs help. How would you approach that, or what can you do to help uh, to help either the co-founder, the the employee, the early stage employee, and so on? Yeah, no, totally. I think it's um, 
in the wake of COVID become a more open conversation, both on our team and with our own founders. Um, a lot of whom it sounds like experience the same sort of journey as, as here in Garong around like feeling like they never have a break from their company. Um, and it, it empathize completely with that, right? I think we often feel on the investor side too that we're like never taking a break because there's never a shortage of startups to be looking at in any particular area, um, especially telemedicine right now. Like healthcare ironically is one of the parts of you know the economy that continues to grow and boom. Um, so it's a really interesting time to be involved in the space um, and a lot of work to be done um, to meet patients in a way that we haven't really met them before. Um, when it comes to supporting, you know, our founders and our companies, I think it, it, the important part for us is to sit back and think about like the holistic picture, kind of like what it sounds like you guys are doing at the individual kind of company level and, and personal founder journey level. For us, of course, yes, taking on investor capital means that at some point your investors are going to expect, uh, you know, good returns at the end of the day. And so the need to scale that company fairly quickly before your next round like does come into play. But they're also humans that you have to work with day in, day out. Like an investor startup relationship is anywhere from like five to 10 years, right? So when we're making a bet on a company, it's a bet on that person, um, especially at the early stages where we sit at kind of the seed and series A. You know, there's often not a lot of traction to respond to um, at, those, at those stages of a company build. And so it's about how do you, how do you approach conversations with that founder? Um, and I think you can sort of start to pressure test those conversations in the, the pitch process with them um, because there are gonna be pointed questions where folks have concerns about how you're different in the market or whether or not there is a market for this type of thing. Um, and being able to just sort of pressure test that with your founders so that when you have that portfolio of folks, you have a really good understanding of, of who they are and their values what, why they started the company and their, you know, intention to keep pushing when times get hard um, and to know really where your investors can fill in some of those gaps for you, right? Like no one is a pure expert on, on anything um, at large with every part of healthcare um, in this case. And so being able to lean on your network of investors and, and their friends and their enterprise relationships that can help you think through some of the things that perhaps are always on your laundry list as a founder to do, but you never get to. Like think about your investors and folks in your advisory boards as like early stage employees that can hop in when you need them because truly the incentives are aligned, right? Helping your company grow and scale helps them from the fund perspective. Um, and so just being able to sit back and, and take it in from like that macro level that right now it feels really hard, but the things that I'm needing help on as a founder and as an investor are actually pretty aligned. And this was a pretty consistent uh, question. Just uh, I can tell you that uh, in our company, which is uh, we've gone through the same struggles and I, I include myself there uh, in a big time. So I guess the world uh, for those uh, not understanding how to help employees, the word you should always keep in mind is empathy because we think we know what people are going through until we actually know. And then you, you say, damn, why, why did I scream at that person? Why did I honk at that person? Why did I, you, you think you, you're right until you're not. So uh, having empathy to, to approach someone and say, okay, I don't think you're doing something right, but tell me, how do you feel? So I think honesty in my experience coming from the founders of Caper and from myself is always the best route. Like asking, how do you feel? And this, go, going to the point of we are in the middle of a pandemic, this one is for the three of you. I would love to know what you think about this because it's also a question that I have uh, and uh, that, I, that I've been struggling with because you, you as an aspiring entrepreneur, as a, an employee, as a founder, you're pushing yourself so hard. But at the same time, in these moments, I believe the world is pushing in uh, or many people feel that way. Many people are good at dealing with this. Many others are not. Uh, I've, I've, I've been so, so, uh, I am trying to. So how do you balance mental health and keep your career ambitions uh, in, a healthy, in a healthy place? Because maybe you're sleeping until 10 because you don't feel so good but you know that those three hours you slept more, you're not producing something. 
and and then I feel bad. So for those out there who who have this question, I would love to hear from the three of you. What do you think about that? Yeah, uh, I can take a stab at this one. Um, great question. I um, I said this a little bit a while ago, but I really do think compassion for yourself goes a long way. Um, and then we are in a pandemic, and there's so much, so many things that are unknown. Um, it's okay if we miss deadlines for yourself for a given day. The bigger goal should just be, are you heading in the direction you want to be? And then um, kind of take a step back and look at your progress on a weekly, monthly, or even like a quarterly basis. Um, for me, I really do try and manage my week on a weekly level. Um, and it's been really helpful because honestly, some days I just you get pulled by operations or other things and you don't achieve what you want to. And there's other days where you actually make a lot of progress on your goals and it, it kind of catches up for the goal progression. So having a little bit of compassion for yourself and then looking at things in a bigger frame ends up actually being quite beneficial. Um, and Yuri said this earlier, I can't highlight how much meditation exercise and like um, prioritizing other facets of your well-being outside of your work actually do come into play. Uh, important part of being an entrepreneur, entrepreneur is knowing balance. And for me, I've been, I'm really grateful for my personal therapist and being able to meditate and have a plethora of like tools to use for investing in my own well-being actually has been really useful. Crying, that's so beautiful. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, the way, you know, I thought this question was really interesting because, you know, we talk about career ambition. Um, but I think the way that I am trying to see things is life ambition. So what kind of life do I want to create for myself? And life includes my career, which is a huge part of my life. Um, it also includes my family, my friends, my partner, um, my well-being. And all of those things combined, you know, make up my life. And so um, you know, I try to take that more holistically and think, how am I doing overall on, across all of these elements? And one of the things I'm glad, Garang, you brought up your personal therapist because, you know, I think that, yeah, my personal therapist has also been incredibly helpful, um, you know, during this time, but also anytime um, kind of in, you know, the journey of building out a startup. And one of the things that continuously comes up is one, you know, making sure I don't burn out. Um, at any given point, and then two, making sure I find meaning both, um, you know, I find a lot of meaning in work, but also outside of work and making sure that there's that aspect too. And I think, um, you know, like I mentioned, you know, that meditation can really, um, you know, and those kinds of habits that you create for yourself can really help. But um, yeah, seeing it not only as, you know, personal and career, but life holistically, life ambition holistically, I think, um, can be really helpful, especially in things like prioritizing, you know, your relationship, um, if you're in a romantic relationship, to make that quality time. I think it's one of these things that, you know, is so easy to not pay attention to. And then, you know, a few years down the line, uh, you know, you kind of, you only see the um, repercussions later. So um, it's all about like small habits now. Yeah, I think I don't have too much to tack on to both of those things because I think beautifully said by both. Um, for me, I think it's about like setting routine and structure. Like I'm very type A, I, I love routine. And like the beginning of COVID was quite the whirlwind of not having any of that. Um, but being able to find things like, you know, a set time that you exercise or for me recently, it's been like a certain date night with my partner, like figuring out the things that can sort of establish a routine that we used to have perhaps, but but don't anymore because so often it can feel like the only thing to react to in today's world is either COVID, politics, or your work um, because you're not seeing that many other people and those are the only headlines we're reading. Um, and so sometimes I found it challenging to figure out like how to even begin a dialogue about anything else anymore. Um, just being able, I think, to give yourself like the kindness and the space to, to sit back with if you have a partner, if you've got roommates, if you've got family that you're in contact with to, to remember, it sounds weird, but like reminisce what it was like pre this time to talk about, you know, personal growth and challenges that you're experiencing or like movies that you watched that you liked um, and kind of like the simple things that 
that were a bigger part of our life, perhaps pre-COVID, but, but still incredibly important. Edward, are you muted? Jesus, sorry about that. And sorry about this mysterious lighting. I just have a beautiful sunset going on here, but it's not, it's not as practical during, <laughs> during a Zoom call. But uh, I was saying thank you. Those are very useful, beautiful answers. Now, uh, personally, for, for, for you, not as, uh, I would say, not as professionals, but as individuals, how do you assess your mental health without working with a therapist? What would be a point in which you say, I think I need help or I'm not at my best if you have no one, no one telling you that you are not at your best? That one is for, for whoever wants to, to answer. It's a tough question. I'm sorry I put you on the spot. Okay, I, I, I will say then, in my case, I have this theory that whenever everything is a mess, which happened in the pandemic pretty much, uh, in my case, every, every, everywhere, I'm like cheaper type A, so routine is my lifesaver for everything. And I lost it all. So my theory is that if you hold on to the one thing that is consistent in your life, that can be a, a, like a like a bayou or bayou. My English, I'm not sure that's the right way to pronounce it. But in the in the ocean, you just you just get in there and wait until you see an island. And the best KPI in my case was my the company. That that was the only consistent thing I had. So if I don't perform well at my company, for me that is a very clear indicator that I am not very stable mentally speaking so it's very noticeable when eduardo is fine and when eduardo is not the results are completely different so that's my kpi and nobody is giving me a hard time about it but i i just need to take a step back and say okay i think i need to to do some uh, internal research and find out what is wrong so that that's my case Well, I am personally a fan of everyone seeking therapy, so I'm a little biased in that way. I think that, you know, I, I get this question um, like over a dinner with friends sometimes for people who don't really think about mental health or, you know, it's a new concept, especially among my Asian friends um, and who are curious about therapy, but they're kind of like, I don't really know what I would get out of it um, or like why I would need it. I'm not depressed or, you know, uh, um, and I think that there's, this sense, um, depending on kind of what your, you know, experience has been with mental health, how much you've discussed it in your different communities, um, your upbringing, you know, I think there's this idea that you need a diagnosis for um, therapy. And actually therapy is really, I personally see it as, you know, it can be treatment uh, for a diagnosis. It can also be, you know, a wonderful and really safe and special space for personal growth uh, in, so, in such a myriad of ways. So, you know, one very um, clear one that I know has, you know, really helped a lot of my friends is personal relationships, um, especially, again, in the Asian community with parents who are more traditionally minded, but, you know, a lot of um, people who are like, man, my parents should really go to couples counseling or, you know, could really benefit from a therapist. And, um, it's easy to think about that for someone else, uh, I think, generally. Um, and I think it's, you know, really powerful when you can experience it yourself and see the results. And then if you feel comfortable, share that with, you know, family members so that, you know, that act alone is kind of destigmatizing the idea of going to therapy. Um, so I think it's, you know, helpful for a myriad of things, whether it's these personal relationships with family, so family relationships, romantic relationships, friendships, um, work-life balance and finding meaning um, and just grounding, and then also a lot of past traumas. So if you're getting stressed or angry at something in a way that doesn't really make sense to you or that you're not, that's not your personal preference for how you would react, you know, being able to find out not only kind of the immediate tools for 
uh, reacting maybe in a healthier way to those situations, but also what really, why are you reacting this way? And having a space to really dig deep and kind of analyze that, um, you know, having, I think knowledge is power. And so having knowledge about yourself um, can really help, you know, kind of create a, uh, create better pathways in your brain um, so that next time something like that happens, you know, it's a better, you have a better reaction. So um, I don't know if I'm answering your question, Eduardo, because I'm basically saying everyone should go to therapy. Um, but those are, if, if there's any issues in those areas, then not even an issue, maybe that's too strong of a word, but any way in which you'd want to improve those areas, I think, um, you know, therapy is an opportunity to do that. And that's one way to measure your mental wellness as well, to kind of tie it back to your question. Uh, what, what about you, Garang? You being on the on the same on the same side of the bias, but maybe not so far. Well, <laughs> what is the? How would you say someone uh, like? How do you assess your own mental health? Which uh, something inspired you to create Violet? So, what was the point in which you said some people need this, and how did you know? Yeah, um, I'll preface by saying I think of mental health as this like. This pyramid with three layers where the middle layer is group care, the top layer is one-on-one -on -one therapy, and the bottom layer is meditative tools and all these like self-service tools, including books you can read that help you think about like your emotions and your life and what's really important to you and why you react certain ways. Um, for me, I over-index on the one-on-one -on -one therapy and the bottom layer. Um, like Chipper, I'm also type A and very extroverted. So I spend my day with people all day long. And I've noticed that group therapy doesn't quite do it for me because it actually, um, when I want to invest in my mental health, I'd rather be alone to actually reflect and simmer for that moment of time. So for me, having a one-on-one -on -one therapist or having tools where I can kind of sit in my bed and think about whatever topic is at top of mind for me, um, that's been really beneficial. But the truth is, and now I sound like a broken record, but I really do think we're human. We have emotions. It's okay if you're feeling down. It's okay if something feels like, hey, I'm feeling off today. The key is to pause and reflect on that and kind of try and like attribute your feelings to what actions caused you to be there. Um, I think in today's society, especially with smartphones, we like um, our attention span is so small that even when we're feeling down, we seldom take the time to learn about why we're feeling a certain way. And maybe I'm projecting because I know I'm guilty of this, um, but it's important to, if you realize that, hey, look, reading the news and constantly seeing all this like news about politics causes me really just sadness and frustration, then maybe limit the amount of time that you consume news or taking the time to reflect your your feelings will cause you to get to those feelings and then taking actions to make sure you have the ratio of kind of like feelings you want goes a long way as well. That's, that's very nice. Uh, I can add something quickly. I have a, 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 someone in the company, which is a, 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 my best friend and my anchor personally and professionally. Uh, every time I feel that my mental health is not in the right place and I'm not sure where to look for it, I I force him to meet uh, for a one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, he he could argue that it's not a it's not a hus uh, hassle, but I, I jokingly say that I force him because he he's the person I go to because I know that whatever he says is going to be very unbiased, and he knows it's about the work, it's about life. So maybe you, it would be good to find that one person that, that can tell you things that you wouldn't know because you're looking at yourself. And now for you, Cheaper, uh, that you have an overview on so many different companies and, and things going on. The, I, I love this question. Uh, someone asked, uh, what can your allies do to help you? So our allies. What can our allies do to help us, especially as we all endure the pandemic? Uh, one can, what can they give? Do, do you have a, an opinion on this topic? Um, allies in terms of like the community from start out, from to the broader queer community? To the, to the, broader, to the broader community. 
Yeah. I mean, I think so much of what I'm hearing in today's conversation is like, it is a inherently very personal choice around whether or not to seek any form of like mental health care. And kind of to Grong's point, I think people often associate that type of support with like one-on-one -on -one care with a trained professional. But the reality is there's so many different ways in which you can find that type of support. And so there's a huge opportunity for folks within the ally community to come together and offer that type of tangible support um, in a way that could be structured in the form of like a group therapy that's led by someone or very unstructured in sort of these one-on-one -on -one conversations that we have with people on, on the day-to-day -day basis, kind of like what you were explaining, Eduardo, with a coworker. Um, the challenge is, of course, around like feeling comfortable sharing that information and, and not necessarily wanting to add an extra burden onto someone else. Um, and also feeling like you're sharing it with the person who has the expertise and the resources to perhaps connect you back with the right forms of care if it becomes something that seems like it needs more expert level care. Um, and so I think there's like different layers. I liked the pyramid analogy that you used around figuring out where you can kind of best um, access those types of supports. Um, and it doesn't start in the same spot for everyone else, for everyone, and it doesn't end up in the same spot for everyone. And so being able to leverage the folks um, in your existing communities that can help serve as a, a resource is incredibly important. And if there's a need to sort of ratchet up that level of care to a different type of provider or a different friend or family member or partner, like it's okay to change that throughout. And the people uh, are also interested in, in well, obviously very related uh, at what, what we're living right now. Any resources that uh, any of you know about, uh, for example, uh, people of color founders, founders of color uh, resources to how do they approach their mental health or LGBTQ Asians uh, that, that want to have a specific place to, to go because some people do need to identify with their specific community. Some others don't, don't care about it, but some do. Do you know of any resources? It's okay if you don't, and this can be a follow-up uh, follow thing for everyone else, but if you know, uh, you, can, you can mention here. I'm sure both of you guys' platforms do this in some way. If you don't want to seem salesy, so I'll do it for you. Um, I mean, I think like various platforms that allow you to find a therapist will um, offer the opportunity for users to input certain um, facets about their own identity where they want to match a therapist with that or a therapist who has competency and understanding those unique parts of your own identity. Um, so I think there's a, a myriad of platforms that are available um, outside of your guys' two companies. I think there's a few that um, we've seen like Ayana Therapy um, within that space, um, Henry Health is a platform for Black men, um, although they're rebranding, so TBD on the name. <laughs> um, but I think most platforms that are trying to ease that burden of connecting a patient with the provider, because as we've talked about, like that initial match can be one of the biggest hurdles to get over to find the right type of resource, um, are really thinking critically about how to best facilitate that type of interaction in a way that allows you to, to overcome arguably one of the hardest parts, which is like finding the right person that you connect with, that you feel comfortable sharing that type of information and where they can offer the type of support that you're looking for in the moment. And uh, just throwing you under the bus, uh, Garang, if, if for LGBTQ Asians, his platform is specifically for LGBTQ, so just send him an email. <laughs> you have uh, a filter. Thank you, Chipper. Exactly. And then for people of color, uh, Yuri's uh, platform is uh, for everyone. There's, uh, there's filtering for whatever you need. So maybe that's a good, I, I'm not trying to promote it. No, no, this is not a sponsorship. I'm just saying that uh, using what we have right now, that, that's a good start plus what Cheaper just said. So uh, that, that should be useful. And uh, we're approaching uh, the end. You want to you wanna say something, Yuri? I was just going to say, um... Yeah, you know, I, I wish I had um, looked this up before joining, um, but I think I'm sure there are meetups, you know, um, for founders who identify um, in certain ways. I think just having a founder community or just being in the startup community is really valuable. So 
I'm not sure um, if like different investors might also offer that, you know, um, groups um, who, you know, for even the employees of the startups that they, uh, that they fund. So um, I think those are also good places um, to look as well. I, I unfortunately don't know any off the top of my head, but yeah. No, that's a good one. Meetup has like, I think one thing for everything, you definitely want, will find a meetup, even if it's meeting up with one person. That's, that's, that's meetup uh, success. And now uh, approaching to the end, for, for people wanting resources, there's this, uh, William Styron wrote a book about depression, about his, uh, his journey through depression. And there's this quote I find very, very funny and, and also very interesting. He says, I have been compelled to become an autodidact in medicine and have accumulated amateur's knowledge about medical matters. I think it's a, a very interesting quote because he got it so much into understanding his his uh, his own reactions that he ended up learning what what he he was going through. So do go out uh, and use any possible resource that you can find to sit down, think about yourself non-judgmentally. Very important, non-judgmentally, and and uh, uh, Dito again Garang uh, having self-compassion and just see. Who I am, what what I don't like, how do I feel, and what could I do to to change it? And you could end up being an amateur doctor for yourself. Now uh, we we could ask answer one question. Somebody wants to send one question in the chat for for the attendees. If you have one question, we can answer one. Let's see if something comes up. Well, no, no questions. I hope that means we answer mo most of what everyone wanted to know. Uh, thank you very much to Twilio, who, who has sponsored this, uh, who made this possible. I want to remind uh, the, the startups or the founders that are present right now. Twilio is giving you $10,200 of credits and Twilio sent great and a hundred dollars in Twilio credit in general. You can apply, you will receive a follow-up email about this with all the details. You can apply in twiliostartups.com and it's applicable only for first time, uh, first time uh, customers. So that's one. And another one that I think is uh, very, very nice about this for everyone, Journey Meditation app uh, will give you a free trial to everyone who attended this, uh, this uh, webinar. So use it, please. It's a good start. I know people that have made good progress in, in a self-assessment of how I am just by sitting down with a meditation app. So you will receive a follow-up email with instructions on how to, how to uh, get the free trial for journey. So thank you uh, very much, Cheaper, Garang, Yuri, I, I hope everyone got something good about this. I know I did, and I really admire all of you for doing something that it's good for people like me who, who definitely can use a lot more of the tele, teletherapy services. Thank you so much for having us, and thanks to everyone for sharing their questions. Yeah, thanks, Eduardo. Well, thanks, thank everyone. you. Take care, everyone. Well, bye. bye.